Welcome to Belling History with the Good Time Girls, a hyper-local podcast about the quirky history of Bellingham, Washington, and the fourth corner of these United States. Even though we like to keep things close to home, these stories are no less entertaining to the masses and those who find themselves, unfortunately, outside of the PNW. We are your hosts. I'm Ren. And I'm Colby, and we are co-owners of Belling History Tours, also known as the Good Time Girls. If you want to know more about our tour business, visit our website at bellinghistory.com. Today we have a re-release episode from Bad Town Season 2 of the City of Subdued podcast, hosted by Annika Fleming and Maria Dalla Gasparina, and co-hosted by us, as well as our founding mother, Marissa McGrath, back in 2020 during the pandemic. If you want to skip ahead and not listen to these if you've heard them before, that's fine, but we are updating some new little tidbits at the end of the episodes if you want to hear what we have to say now, um, or you can come back in a couple months when we will hopefully have some new episodes. Yeah, yeah, today's episode is called really bad town. (laughs) It's kind of the worst of bad town. We have some content warnings, including, but not limited to, the KKK. Things that we want to talk about in this episode, being two white cisgendered females, are that this is really focused around the KKK and how shitty things were around here for marginalized citizens. We also want to acknowledge, and Colby, you can kind of chime in here, but it's Black History Month. We're re-releasing this in Black History Month. Um, That's February. And we didn't really intend to time it that way. It just no. um, fell out that way. So I'm hoping to post more stories, uplifting stories, about <laughs> some of our citizens of color historically here in Bellingham. I'm going to do my best to kind of counterbalance some of this. And I will also will be posting links in our show notes to Washington-wide uh, or Black history organizations and events locally. There's some things going on at Western. Uh, the library's got curated books and things like that. So we'll post links to all that kind of stuff. It's it's always a weird, weird one to talk about. Yeah. And also it's necessary. But also it like weirdly gets a lot of traction. And I always have real mixed feelings about yeah, that. Too. Mm-hmm. Anything with the KKK seems to get like tons of shares and the such. And I'm just like, oh, God. I know it's a little overwhelming. I feel that way. Yeah. KKK and serial killers. And yeah, like, ah. I know. People like it's like the ambulance chasing it, it, train wreck. It does feel like effect yeah, you're or something. A train wreck. Yeah. So I guess without further ado, let's listen to like really, really, really bad town. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So this week, we will be learning about Bellingham being a bad town, and we mean really bad town, specifically Bellingham's history with the KKK. That's coming right up on this week's episode of Bad Town. Hello, and welcome to Bad Town, where we discuss the darkest and the baddest parts of Bellingham and Whatcom County history. Today, we are joined, as always, by our season two co-host, Colby Labrie. Hi, everybody. And Marissa McGrath. Hi. Marissa, you said you were kind of operating on some nervous energy right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about that before we dive in? Yeah. Hello, people of the future. You know what's about to happen tomorrow or maybe multiple days over many morrows and but this is the eve of the election that we're recording this and we picked a real light topic because today's story is about the history and legacy of the Ku Klux Klan in Bellingham so on top of being really nervous about what's going to happen on a national level I'm also really nervous as 
a white woman in America talking about, among other things, the women's auxiliary group of the KKK in the town that I grew up in. And so I didn't even grow up here. That's the other problem. Oh, I did. I totally did. And it's important for us because this is part of our legacy, whether these are our ancestors or not. Yes. No, it's important for us to talk about. And it's not a light subject whatsoever. It's heavy. And, you know, it's just it feels like it was a little self-punishing. Yeah, the night before the election, let's just like... Let's just dive right in to the the most upsetting, difficult chapter in Bellingham history. The I don't know. I think it's clan. kind of appropriate in a way because Lord help us. I mean, maybe not Lord because <laughs> Lord is problematic in the clan. And I don't know. Somebody. We can praise my dog, Tilly. Oh, Tilly, help us. Tilly, I beg of you. Anyways. So as far as background, what do we need to know about the history of the Ku Klux Klan itself, like before it came to Bellingham? First, it's important to understand that there were three waves. There are three waves of the KKK, just like feminism, oh, hey. um, <laughs> which weirdly lines right up. And sometimes they've weirdly overlapped in a Venn diagram of horror. Thank you white feminism. But we're currently in the third wave of both the KKK and feminism. And the initial wave was right after the Civil War. The first chapter of the KKK was founded in Tennessee. And it was little more than like a Confederate frat. It was dudes getting together and being like, we were all in the Civil War together and we fought in the Confederacy. And now we're just like brothers in arms and we're going to get together. But as chapters were started, it became more of like a secretive vigilante style group. And the Klan targeted freedmen, so men and women who were uh, freed slaves and their allies. It sought, sought to restore white supremacy through threats and violence, including murder. And they targeted white northern leaders, sympathizers, and any politically active black people. The Klan declined in strength, in part because of internal weaknesses that first wave. It didn't have a central organization, as you might have guessed. This was before the internet, and so it was really hard <laughs> for everybody... <laughs> To sort of like ha to have this like organization where there are chapters in all these different towns, you didn't necessarily have a, a central control or ideology that everyone sort of bought into. And, and the other thing that happened is there were, frankly, some criminal elements who were really drawn to it and sadists. More fundamentally, though, it, it declined because it failed to achieve its central objective, which was to overthrow the Republican state governments in the South. And a reminder that Republicans meant a different thing then. Yeah, they were the party of Lincoln, as you might have heard recently. <laughs> Democrats were not the party where you ex that you expected to be standing up for racial inequality. Republicans, that was the party where we saw a lot of work for more racial justice as much as it existed at the time. So yeah, so Washington State never had a KKK at this time, but they did have one in the second wave. Yeah. So the Washington State Klan basically was part of the second wave that really kind of climaxed in the 20s. It was very much anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-radical, white supremacist organization. And their goal was 100% Americanism. Ooh. Yeah. And this their idea of Americanism is very rigid view of like, who can be American? So the second wave claimed like 4 million members across the country, and it dominated some state legislatures in Colorado, Indiana, and Oregon. And in 1924, actually shaped presidential politics and pressured politicians to pass the most severe immigration restriction in the history of the United States. And the Washington State KKK during the 20s was really kind of concentrated and founded by organizers in Oregon, which was probably the strongest Klan chapter at the time. There were a lot of massive public rallies in Washington and Oregon in the early 1920s. And while they supposedly publicly disavowed violence, Klan members did participate in violent intimidation campaigns against labor activists and also Japanese farmers in Yakima Valley. A big thing they did was put forward a ballot initiative in 1924 against Catholic schools. So voters defeated that pretty soundly. But the second wave of the KKK nationally was kind of linked directly to this release of this film adaptation of a 
book called The Klansman by Frank Dixon. And the film was called The Birth of a Nation. Ooh. Yeah. So back in 1905, uh, Thomas Dixon published his novel, The Klansman, and Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan. So this novel portrays them in this very glorified way, portrays them as chivalrous. And, you know, they're doing what they do for the sake of white supremacy and white womanhood, very specifically. And this play was a national success or the novel. So they quickly turned it into a play and mm -hmm. um, toured the country with like a ton of publicity. It was very sensational. And this play was performed here in Bellingham at Beck's Theater, which was right on Cornwall Avenue, kind of where the B&B Bank building is across from the current Chuckanut Distillery. So this play intensely featured like fully robed Klansmen mounted on horses on stage. And then it was turned into this attendance record setting movie called Birth of a Nation, which also played the same theater. It was then called the American Theater, but it was the same place in uh, June of 1916. So I've heard of Birth of a Nation. And I mean, obviously, it's somewhat prolific as it is horrible. Why has this made such an impact? So Birth of a Nation is three hours long. It's it's the longest film that had ever been made up to this point. So that was impressive for the time. Um, its plot juxtaposed this kind of conventionally agreed, agreed upon historic events. Like they have a very accurate depiction of Lincoln's assassination. That's kind of like the seminal portrayal of it. That seems to be extremely historically accurate. You know, most people in 1916 could kind of imagine themselves in Ford, Ford's theater at the night at the night that John Wilkes Booth shot. Abraham Lincoln. And so it does a really good job of portraying that. But at the same time, it portrays African Americans, um, many of whom are played in the film as white actors in blackface, but not all. There's black actors as well. Um, and it portrays them as these like unintelligent rubes who are sexually aggressive towards white women. The film presents the Ku Klux Klan as this heroic force necessary to preserve American values. And it really emphasizes the idea of the white supremacist social order as being like the norm and the thing and then the obviously right thing that we should be yeah. protecting. Uh, I know that showing black men being aggressive, especially sexually aggressive towards white women, that that's kind of a trope in all horrible racist movies. Like, mm -hmm. what's the one? Uh, Reefer Madness. Oh, yeah. Yes. Was, was that the 40s? 30s, 40s? Where I think it's the 30s, but yeah, it's late 30s, early 40s, I think. Oh, man, I, I'd have to look it up. But <laughs> yeah, know. I'm terrible with dates. <laughs> so I'm write them down. Somebody Google it. So you asked initially, Annika, what made it like such a big success or such a big hit and what made it so important? It was a film full of innovation that and it really odd audiences. It, you know, like, I didn't really understand this, but do you remember when people were really obsessed with the James Cameron movie where they're like cat people and they're in the sky? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. no, but I'm really glad that this is coming together with the uh, birth of a nation. <laughs> I'm sorry. The movie is Avatar. So this movie was sort of the avatar of its time. It was really long. It was really epic. And it was completely full of all this innovation that really inspired people and drew them in. It was the first movie to include an intermission because it was so long. So people had like a break in the middle of it. It was the first to have a musical score for an orchestra. So you could have a full on orchestra playing. And so some people went to see this and there was a pit. A lot of times in the 19 teens, you went to go see movies like you did in Bellingham in a place where it was actually a theater and they'd put up a screen and show a movie, but there was still an orchestra pit. So they had a full musical score for an orchestra. So you'd watch it with that playing and it was a first one to do that it was the first movie to have close-ups and fade outs it included a carefully staged battle sequence with hundreds of extras which was another first they had tricks that made it look like it was th it was thousands of people it was the first american motion picture to be screened in the white house it was Whoa. viewed there by president woodrow wilson he wanted to see it there's this majority black reconstruction era state legislature is de depicted they're acting like the state legislatures in the south were just like taken over and it's depicted as chaotic and drunken it's actually really disturbing to watch it's like 
black state reps are on the floor Mm -hmm. and they're taking their shoes off and gnawing on pork chops literally on the house floor and yelling it's just supposed to be this chaotic and it's just extremely offensive depicting these black men who are who are representatives for their state as just savages animals yeah yeah literally and then there's a part in it where a white woman is pursued by what is clearly a white man in blackface and he proposes to her and she tr- she runs away from him and eventually she jumps off of a cliff to avoid him <sighs> It's been shown to film students for decades ever since because it has all these pioneering cinematic achievements. It's considered this like historically really important film. Spike Lee talks about how he was shown it at NYU Film School when he was there. And it was just shown without any acknowledgement of the overt racism. It was just like, these are all the important things. Why this is important. Watch this three hour movie. Wow it's crazy to imagine you would be in film school and they just kind of gloss over the fact that you just watched something that was genuinely upsetting to any reasonable human adult Mm -hmm. (laughs) that would watch it in a mod with through a modern lens but yeah so how exactly did the kkk get started in bellingham so we know the klansman play was at bax in 1908 and the silent film birth of a nation was the same theater called the American in 1916. We do know by 1920, the Klan were definitely making a concerted effort to organize and recruit in the Pacific Northwest. Um, And this was really tied in with this rise of a lot of groups who are anti drinking, um, pro prohibition. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This is from history.com, but they say like the Klan's main targets were immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, especially Catholic ones. Prohibition advocates had already linked them with drinking and criminality. So for people of color, people who are immigrants and Catholic, this was a time of raids and violence and terror. So from the beginning, prohibition was really tied in with an anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic agenda and bias. And most of its advocates were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who thought only people like them could be quote unquote real Americans and believed that the country was under siege by immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants from places like Italy, and that these people were threatening the United States with their foreign, you know, drinking habits. Marissa, do you want to add anything to this? As these enforcement failures multiplied, governments had a really hard time enforcing prohibition. Anti-liquor crusaders found a powerful ally in the Ku Klux Klan. The organization had snowballed after 1920 in the Midwest and West, and there was this like marketing team in the KKK that was Elizabeth Tyler and Edward Young Clark, and they were former fundraisers for the Anti-Saloon League. There's all this prosperity, and you could be rich now, but all these immigrants are here keeping you from getting what you deserve, and they're drinking in these Hmm. bars, and they're being loud and obnoxious. And so, like, completely unprecedented and never repeated in history ever again type stuff, obviously. Like, (laughs) we learned from that. (laughs) Um, We're done with that. So, okay, so... Other forms of like post-war also aided the growth of the Klan, but nothing did more that than the 18th Amendment making prohibition happen. The Klan and this separate organization, the women of the KKK, they recruited heavily from the nation's white Protestant prohibition organizations that already existed, and they promised like militant action to ensure prohibitions enforcement. They were going to do violent activity. Not surprisingly, the Klan targeted the drinking of those they identified as em- enemies of the 100% Americanism that they talked about, mm-hmm. so Catholics, foreigners, and African Americans. And they gained a foothold in white Protestant evangelical communities with this promise to bootleggers and moonshiners to like get them out of business. Their whole deal was that if officers of the law didn't, the Klan would vow to step in with vigilante justice. And often they actually got the support of local governments, um, city councils. Such assholes. I know. (laughs) So this is also like how Democrats become the party that ethnic minorities are going to more because they're against prohibition. The Democrats are are saying, you know, this isn't working. This doesn't make sense. And I think minorities are seeing Republicans at this time that um, really malign them and make them feel like they don't belong in America. And the Democrats are saying, look, this whole prohibition thing's gotten a little bit out of hand. And they weren't necessarily like courting directly the ethnic minorities. And when I say ethnic minorities at this time, I mean like, you know, Italians, 
Southern European, but also Irish and in some cases German, recent immigrants, they're not necessarily courting them. They're just not actively maligning and uh, railing against people from other places. So that becomes attractive. And it's the first time that Democrats go, oh, hey, maybe this mm-hmm. is a path for, for power in the future. Yeah. And changes in their views are probably maintained, obviously, by a, a widening base. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. a cyclical nature. Anyway, topical. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I did see that in 1921, in July, in various Washington state newspapers, it was reported that African Americans in the state of Washington appealed to Governor Hart to halt the Klan organization in the state. So it's pretty clear it's happening at that point in Washington state. And in 1921, in Seattle and Tacoma papers, there was big articles in November saying, you know, Klan organizers come out in the open, um, showing their credentials, talking about the imperial wizard at the time, whose name was William Joseph Simmons. And they admitted the organization had a couple hundred, between 100 and 200 members at that time in the Northwest. And it seems like there was a lot of like hotbed again in Oregon around Medford. I saw the grossest article that was talking about the cute candy kids, all spelled with K's, were inviting people to come to their taffy pull. Uh, it's terrible. And this makes me ashamed to have a name that starts with a K, honestly. <laughs> yeah. But this is the first mention that I found in the Bellingham Herald where they're specifically saying there's KKK in Bellingham. And it's from April of 1922. They say that there is a Ku Klux Klan membership in Bellingham was the statement to a Herald reporter today by a man who declared himself to be a candidate for membership. And they went on to say the plan of the Klan here as elsewhere is believed to be to let the clamor diminish and to go ahead with whatever the motives and plans may be. In other words, the password seems to be lay low. So they're kind of like, like, okay, everyone's kind of in a hubbub because the Klan is back. And um, the paper also says that they're, you know, like county attorney Loomis Baldry says, like, don't worry, it's a criminal act for two or more people to meet wearing masks or other concealing apparel um, at any place other than fancy dress balls or masquerades. Also, that's a really important thing we didn't mention before is that that comes from Klansmen in the book and the birth of a nation. In the first wave of the Ku Klux Klan, there weren't, they didn't wear sheets and mm. masks. That's one of the reasons that we know the second wave in the 1920s was very much inspired by the film. Um, it was just a, a decision a theatrical to... Theatrical thing, yeah. Exactly. So in December of 1922, the Bellingham Herald reported that the Klan had been meeting secretly for more than a year in various office buildings and reported in December of this bold session where they had kind of held something a little more publicly visible in the Woodsman of the World Hall, which at that time was on Commercial Street. So this man who had tried to get in, he just saw a bunch of people going in and wandered up and was like trying to just go in and see what was happening and was met at the door with a guy in a hood who asked him the question, what of the night, which he didn't know the answer to. So he was slammed the door shut in his face and he couldn't get in. So he went to the newspaper and told him all about it. So he said there was about 50 men seen entering the hall and the Herald investigated and the woodsmen of the world said they didn't know the KKK was meeting there as they had rented the hall under the name the Citizens Patriotic League. So W-O-W? Woodsmen of the world. world. It's a fraternal oh, okay. order. So it's like the Elks or the Shriners, the Eagles, all of those fraternal groups. So there was the woodsmen of the world and had their little brotherhood meetings. It makes me think of Matt Shea from Spokane. So he, he's an elected representative in Spokane who's like straight up, he's a white supremacist. Oh, yeah. God. yeah. And he's like, looks like a cool hipster pastor dad and he's a lawyer. That's the new insidious way of get, going mm-hmm. about things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, Nazi nowadays look a lot, lot more like cool Justin Timberlake. Yeah. I'm not saying he's a Nazi, but they look more like him than they do... Uh, Uh, fucking grand wizard so anyways he was part of a group called coalition of the western states and um it's called (laughs) cows cows (laughs) (laughs) sorry 
But anyways, just a bunch of heifers hanging out. When I was living in Wisconsin not that long ago, it's really weird, but the there was like a ska kid kind of neo-Nazi thing vibe that was happening. Mm-hmm. A kid that literally wore like platform van type shoes and, you know, their hair cut nicely and then that was a neo-nazi vibe i hung out with a ton of you know nazi skins they were everywhere in bellingham when i was punk rocker there was a lot of overlap argued with a lot of them but hung out with them nonetheless Mm -hmm. i think of that as like as something in the past but i think you're totally right annika i think like the way that it works and the way it clearly was working Um, in Bellingham and other places in the 1920s was just like, well, there's people of all stripes and people that are like, you're nice next door neighbors who just want there to be good jobs available for their friends and family and just want to have good Christian values taught to their kids. And, you know, it's just like, there's some places that people can really agree on. And then all of a sudden they diverge in this totally bizarre direction. And they're all of a sudden like a QAnon person. (laughs) You're like, oh, (laughs) I must in jump dark. in with the the first major clan appearance like publicly where they were just like out in Bellingham was 4th of July 1923 they burned a big old cross on top of Seahome Hill and um that got a lot of attention and apparently there was actually a little scuffle with a few angry residents who went up there and confronted them and this whole thing was actually described by the clan in their own publication um, which was called watcher on the tower they just talk about how thousands of persons in the city of bellingham beheld the fiery cross emblem of the knights of the ku klux klan which burned from the top of seahome hill near huntoon drive on the night of the fourth many cars loaded with spectators ventured to the top of huntoon drive to gain a better view of the demonstration And then they described this large Casey. And this is a nickname for a member of the Knights of Columbus. That's what my Catholic family was. Yep. And they are Catholic, right? So it's another fraternal order, mutual benefit society, but they are a Catholic one. So they're just basically like anyone who's not clan is a Casey. So they're like, this big Casey comes out of the bushes and t- and asks the clansmen, like, are you here for this demonstration? And when he says yes, the guy punched him and knocked him to the ground. And knocked off his glasses, but then... Wait, the cl- Klansman punched the Casey or the Casey no, punched the Klansman? No, the Casey punched the Klansman. Hell yeah. Right? <laughs> and, Take that. But then, like, they're all like, but then, like, all these people came out of the woods who were there for the Klan demonstration. And they don't oh. say anything more, but they say, it's quite evident that from now on, the Klan demonstrations of this city will pass unmolested by the Caseys or any of their hirelings unmolested who's doing the molesting (laughs) right so also in 1923 i just want to point out that the paper reported there was a women's auxiliary to the kkk had been organized and they were known as camellia with a k of course and the chief of police frazier at the time was quoted as saying it's a pity so much beauty must be forced to blush under a pillow slip it's a pity so much beauty must be forced to blush under a pillow slip like is he pro i can't tell if he's yeah it's like i can't tell either is he it, pro them is he anti them probably a little bit of both yeah i'm getting the women are so pure they shouldn't join the kkk <laughs> vibe but they should just not join the kkk for other reasons or like it's right. just too bad that you put a hood over your pretty face beautiful face yeah. <laughs> like yeah, you gross. should just be able to be out in the open about it oh yeah so aside from, you know, like setting Seahome Hill on fire, what else did the clan do in Bellingham? Um, oh, lots. <laughs> in March 26th of 1923, the Herald reported an incident that happened at First Christian Church at C and Halleck Streets when six, six robed and hooded members of the KKK startled the audience, pastor and choir when they marched up the aisle, saluted the pastor, I can, I can only imagine what that looks like, and stood in front of the altar, and then they handed the minister an envelope containing $100 and commending him for his work. They really tried to garner public attention and support during this period. I think they were making a big show of like, here is $100, you're welcome. Just remember who brought it to you. So in their own publication, The Watcher on the Tower, they described how they were planning a large campaign in Whatcom, Skagit, and San Juan counties. Uh, There would be extensive advertising and lectures, and they wanted to engage well-appointed offices in the heart of the business district in Bellingham, from which 
they will conduct the propagation work and and they we're going to do a great membership drive in the fall in fact they had and they've had it, several offices in downtown bellingham one being above where um, Bayou on Bay is now. They said, if you don't want to see your children under the velvet heels of potpourri, not potpourri like dead plants that your mom <laughs> had in the 90s and everywhere in every bowl in the house, but potpourri like Pope like the Pope in Rome. If you don't want to see your children under the velvet heels of potpourri, do your bit now to back the propaganda that will arouse America to its danger. Three dollars will buy you or your friend 52 numbers of the Watcher, the bright and shining sword of the spirit in the campaign of Protestantism. So they literally call it propaganda, which I think is fascinating. It's like, (laughs) help us disseminate propaganda. (laughs) So according to the testimony of O.H. Carpenter, who is a grand dragon of the KKK in Washington State from Christmas Day 1923 to July 1st of 1925, Klan membership doubled from less than 5,000 to almost 10,000. So in 1926, they opened offices in the Long Building. This is what that's the one that's above Bayou. And in 1926, there was also the Tulip Parade scandal it, from the Herald from May 1st, 1926. I'll just read this to you. By withdrawing their entry in the Tulip Parade, the spokesmen for the Ku Klux Klan have restored the harmonious relations in the Tulip Cabinet and removed the danger that the celebration would be marred by an unfortunate controversy. The cabinet was divided on the question, each side presenting arguments that could not be disposed of as trivial. And it looked for several days as if the division might lead to a serious situation. The Herald last night suggested that the Klan be big enough and broad enough to compose the controversy by withdrawing its float. It was done so in the interests of harmony, and the Herald feels on this account it is entitled to commemoration for a praiseworthy act. So the Herald is literally saying, you know, the KKK was going to be in the tulip parade and they had a float and they were all ready to go. And then there was this like split vote of the tulip parade commission about whether or not they were going to be allowed. And then, you know, the good on them, the KKK decided to bow out and the Herald feels on this account, it is entitled to commendation for a praiseworthy act. Thanks. So anyway, they held their own parade. Mm -hmm. It was... (laughs) It was in Cornwall, followed by a picnic in Cornwall Park. Oh, yeah, the Herald called the, the float a striking feature. And we definitely have pictures of this. It's a really common picture a lot of people have seen as the float for the KKK. And during the actual parade, three members of the original Klan, former residents of Tennessee, West Virginia, and Arkansas, rode on top. So the original Klan being that first wave of the Klan. It's probable that they were honored as members of the first Klan, which was disbanded in 1879. Then a few later, years later, in 1929, there was a convention of the Knights of the KKK realm of Washington held in Bellingham. We had the state, the state convention. 300 plus people attended and Mayor John Kellogg gave a welcome address. So our mayor got up and said, hey, everybody, welcome. And he presented the Grand Dragon of the Washington State Ku Klux Klan with a key to the city. Ooh, Yeah. So that's worth like taking a moment to pause on. And then in the mid 1930s, a Klan official was involved in ousting Western Washington University's president, Charles Fisher. It was this anti-communist witch hunt, to be honest. Um, Mm -hmm. Fisher had defended having some books at the WWU library that were by Marx and other socialist thinkers. President Fisher is like, well, yeah, we have these books because we have a library and the library has books about all kinds of thinkers. And Mm -hmm. not only were there Klan official that was involved in this kind of task force that was deciding whether or not um, President Fisher should stay at Western, but so was the president and CEO of the Bellingham Herald. They were really Mm -hmm. anti-communist and they pushed hard to push him out. So Mm. it was this major clan goal to influence and fill public positions and to try to keep them free from undesirable elements and under the control of white Protestants. So, you know, if you wanted to hire a Catholic police chief or whatever, they were going to be really openly loud and boisterous about it. Mm -hmm. So did the KKK face opposition in Bellingham? 
Yes, they did. And I guess the most outspoken and really well-positioned civic leader to do so was John Joseph Donovan or J.J. Donovan, who was an Irish Catholic. And he had been involved in early railroads. And he's the Donovan of Bloedel Donovan Lumber Mills. Super prominent local citizen, lots of money, history of civic involvement. So J.J., as a Catholic, he vigorously denounced the Klan in a talk at the Catholic Confederation of Western Washington. This was right after the fiery cross burning on July 4th. 1923, to which the Klan responded in their publication by making fun of him and saying, Donovan is in the right church, but the wrong country. So and then I mean, you had like in 1926, there was clearly people who were against the Klan participating in the tulip parade and so on and so forth. However, there was enough people on the other side that it was sort of a draw. Um, after the Klan convention in 1929, J.J. Donovan again wrote a letter of protest to the Klan's presence in Bellingham to the Herald, and he charged the Klan and he said, they are the most unpatriotic and un-American organization in America. He further wrote, here in Washington, there being few Negroes and Jews, the attack has been centered on the Catholics. Here in Bellingham, he says also, it points to a few officers who owe their election to its influences, to a police department entirely free from the three objectionable elements, to a fire department practically so, and with high hopes that other city departments will be 100% American. Hmm. And his concluding words were, For 40 years I have striven for social and religious harmony in this community. A large majority of people have done the same. The Klan violates the basic principles of the Constitution. It has nullified the amendments for protection of the Negro in the South. It now, in its brazen grasp for power in a dry community, claims to support the 18th Amendment. The Klan is on the wane everywhere. Its record is one of shame. It is a dying power for evil. Mm. Or so he hoped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too, because like as a Irish, I like to call myself um, ethnically Catholic because I, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> I have all of the heritage and none of the heritage. But um, mm-hmm. we, <laughs> we uh, you know, like it's so Irish Catholic to be like, since there aren't any black people or Jewish people to attack here, they're coming for us Catholics. And like, it's so hard to be the Catholics. And I mean, it's, I mean, there's definitely been moments in our history where Catholics were really persecuted, but JJ Donovan was in a pretty And nice... Catholics have been super powerful too. Which, yeah. You and know. so was JJ Donovan in this situation. JJ Donovan was a rich, privileged dude. He basically is the reason that we have St. Patrick's Church in Fairhaven because he basically bought it for the Catholics on that side of town so that he would have to go all the way over to assumption so like it it's not to diminish his contribution to the community and also not to diminish the fact that he took the time and the energy to say this is lame these people suck (laughs) but i'm not gonna pin a star on his blazer or anything no it's it's important to recognize that he's coming from a very privileged position in his ability to stand up and say that in the first place right you know like not everybody could get away with that and luckily for him he could and thanks jk so what causes the decline of the second wave of the KKK. Internal divisions and also criminal behavior by the leaders, which is the juicy detail stuff. So there are these highly publicized convictions, and one of them is Indiana's Grand Wizard, D.C. Stephenson. He was convicted of the abduction, rape, and murder of a woman named Madge Ooh. Oberholzer. There was this external opposition brought about this collapse in the membership. It was like a Weinstein scenario. People were basically saying in all these communities the Grand Wizard or the Grand Dragon of my community has done all these terrible things. So they're supposed to be these prohibitionists and these defenders of Protestant women. But this guy had this horrific abduction and rape and murder of this woman. And during the trial, the Klan's image as upholders of law and morality was just destroyed. Mm-hmm. And and it was proven that Stevenson, this this rapist and murderer, and many of his asso- associates were really genuinely womanizers and alcoholics. And that mm-hmm. the that scandal, the charges, and the trial led to this rapid decline in the second wave of Klan activity. 
That's really mm-hmm. interesting because that kind of ties in actually with Bellingham with J. Frank Adams, who is the Grand Dragon here in the 40s. And there's all these weird articles in the Herald where like his house was broken into and his wife, you know, had this horrible event because he wasn't home where they broke in and she was there. But it wasn't really like clear what they were after, but they clearly stated like he is the Grand Dragon and they were looking for maybe money or something, but she didn't know these men and is very, very strange, but it just, it, it pointed to me to like, there's some kind of internal, crimey, crazy shit going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then what ended up happening with him? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so he was quoted in these articles as being the Grand Dragon during the 40s. And during his lifetime, he was co-owner and manager of KVOS, which started out as a radio station and then, of course, became our public television station here so he was the head guy for 18 years and after his death i think he died in like 1960 his wife lived in the house for another 10 years and after that house was sold and you know all of this clan history was sort of forgotten it was being remodeled and it was at the time people who were working on it in like the late 70s early 80s found a cache of all these clan robes and pamphlets and crap in their attic And it got brought to the museum. And I believe the museum kept like, you know, one or two as samples for the collections. You know, the rest I've heard just ended up floating around town in thrift stores and yard sales. so weird. I know. The house that this was found in became La Casa Vieja, a Mexican restaurant. But there's a really interesting pamphlet from the museum, um, which I have a copy of. And there's, it's really just pretty clearly it's called the clan today and it's like why support the clan and what is the clan going to do next and it gives you like bullet points of all the shit excuse my french and (laughs) there's things like eternal vigilance is the price of liberty not only for ourselves but in all caps for our children and only in all caps organized militancy can achieve public purpose and what is the clan going to do next they are going to fight for every measure that will make our country and our faith secure fight for every measure that will weaken and destroy our enemies fight for the complete fulfillment of protestant americanism expose and combat all anti-american and anti-protestant propaganda yeah the thing that's on there that's the most creepy is the white supremacy versus negro equality protestantism mm-hmm. versus romanism patriotism versus alienism uh it lays it really out and it says their specific purposes include to reduce immigration by at least half to firmly establish americanism in public schools through the u.s department of education to stop the teaching of anti-americanism in public schools especially under the guise of religion guard Mm -hmm. america from racial degradation and political disaster by ending legalized social and political equality through the repeal of the 15th amendment enact and enforce segregation and miscegenation laws miscegenation being can't marry someone outside of your race i think it's important to note that they're You know, we know from recent news stories that white supremacist organizations have never fully gone away in Whatcom County. People often say Whatcom County, but we don't know that there is it's not happening in Bellingham. And we have examples Mm -hmm. as late as the 1990s of crosses being burned in different locations in Bellingham. Oh, yeah. Like growing up here when I was in high school, friends of mine in the county pulled up at a crossroads and the car to the right of them in the crossroads was filled with people in clan outfits. There's so many stories. Like I gave a tour one time to a woman and I was giving a tour to her and her friends for their bachelorette party. And she told me that when she moved here, she was, she's a black woman. And when she moved to Bellingham from Seattle, all of her black friends said, you know, that's a sundown town, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a town. So sundown town is a town where if you are, person of color you need to be inside after dark because not the implication being not just that like you could be harmed because you are black by the citizenry but that you could be harmed by the police department because you are black so we know that you know we've got a chapter of proud boys here now we know that there are other kind of extremist organizations that are operating in our county and we know this hasn't gone away you know, we have this legacy and it's important for us to understand it and to keep it in our thoughts. You know, the recent guy who was putting, what was it, like swastika stickers yeah. on yes. 
things and he was like sticking up swastika stickers it's like when people act so surprised and offended it's like this isn't new and it's not unique and we're not immune and we aren't separate no i think it's important for people i mean we're in this weird like what we kind of feel like it's like this liberal little enclave in the pacific northwest and i think a lot of people don't realize they think slavery that's the south you know and all of these like intense racial issues that you know isn't part of our heritage here but it very much is Mm -hmm. it absolutely is slavery and all of the above and we need to really take a hard look at that yeah it's funny the uh pamphlet that you shared some of the specific points that that pamphlet tries to make is still on um I was trying to find the website, but I can't find it. But it's called the Northwest Imperative. Oh, God. And that's a current website it, and a current, it's like pretty much a blog. Yeah. No, you can absolutely see the seeds of a lot of groups today. Um, there's This is where it grew from. Yeah. This is the horse shit. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know what else you'd call it. Well, this was, <laughs> this was heavy. Heavy and topical. And, you know, I, I really hope that this gives some of our listeners some idea about the shit that has happened in the past in our great town uh, and the shit that's still happening. Both can exist. There's places like this that we we really enjoy living in, but there can be some really bad shit happening. Yeah. I'm just going to throw out one more little thing is that, you know, white people, you might find this kind of crap in your family tree. It's not uncommon. You're probably going to find some slave owners. This is a thing you can take and move beyond. Mm -hmm. It's good to face up to it and to take it as a lesson and then stepping forward to be like, I am above this heritage or this bullshit. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Yeah, we have Mm -hmm. a lot to learn. And Mm -hmm. that's the thing. The reason that I really like history and always come back to it. I know that I have more to learn. So that's what Mm -hmm. um, this topic is reminding me of today is we still have so much to learn and understand and to grow from as a culture and a community. And we can do that. We just have to look hard enough at some of these Mm -hmm. subjects. With that, I'm going to say good (laughs) night. Yep. Is that the horse shit? (laughs) You can put that in if you want. I don't care. No. Yeah. It's staying in. Not for the radio edition. (laughs) Okay, so what are your thoughts here today in 2023? 2023. It's 2024. 24. No. Bren, what are your thoughts in 2024? <laughs> uh, you know, like we said at the beginning of the episode, this this topic, probably the most important one we talk about, but it still amazes me how many folks and local folks are shocked by the KKK being in Bellingham or racism in general being in Bellingham. It's pretty wild. We, we like to think of ourselves as this isolated little liberal community, and that is just really not the case. Yeah. Whatsoever. So, you know, it's a good one to bring up. Also, love that the city I was born in got a little shout out. That's Medford, Oregon. <laughs> oh, the little children God. of the KKK doing their taffy poll. Oh, God. I didn't even Sweet realize Jesus, that was you guys, where that's you were where born. I was born and raised. Just lovely. Yeah. Oregon um, was pretty bad. Yeah. I was raised in Grants Pass, Oregon. Just. And, but it was never, ever brought up in school or in any other formal setting. Right. Uh, it was just kind of a myth that was underlying. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. When we talk never about it here it. in Bellingham, it's kind of a thing mm-hmm. that I like, I do, you mm-hmm. know, feel strongly about teaching yeah. people. Yeah. Well. I don't think it's on any curriculum here either until you no. get to college, maybe, and take like a local Fair enough. So history you class. No, no, not at all. Yeah. It's interesting mm-hmm. how like quickly they were able to just sweep that right under the rug. Yeah. Under the sheet. Under the sheet. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Those are my thoughts. Okay. Well, I mean, there's no good thoughts on no, this. No good thoughts. I don't really have anything new to add either, except that, you know, I, I do feel like in a, we live in a time where even teaching black history in some places in our country currently is, you know, feels under attack as controversial to teach black history. <laughs> I just, I find it so funny that people are trying to teach only history that isn't uncomfortable. I'm like, (laughs) 
Okay, what's that leave us with? Yeah, exactly. Where does that leave us? Um, good luck. I'm eager to know. <laughs> Okie dokie. Right. So let's wrap it up. Okay, that wraps up this episode. We'd like to thank you all for listening to Belling History with the Good Time Girls. Well, hey there, mama. Where'd you go? You gotta be just what you saw. That's too bad. Too bad. subscribe review our podcast on your favorite podcast platforms like us on all of the social medias and check out all of our tours and events read our show notes and our lovely blog all of that at bellinghistory.com We'd like to thank Devin Champlin and the late, great Lucas Hicks for the use of the Gallus Brothers song, Too Bad West Coast Blues. You can find the Gallus Brothers and Devin Champlin on Bandcamp, and you can find Devin at Champlin Guitars in Bellingham. Lost my hat, lost my brim, looking like a crow's nest, swinging from a limb, that's too bad, too bad. Well, I got no bugging, I got no smokes, I look like Grand Pap and all of his folks, that's too bad. Tune in next time for more Belling History. History. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.